So we'll be looking primarily at 18, but if you'll allow me just to give you a, a little bit of an overview of the book. It's a big book. So turn in your Bibles to Jeremiah 1, uh, right after the big prophet Isaiah. <coughs> How is it that our British brothers and sisters, Isaiah? Isaiah. Isaiah. There is Jeremiah. <coughs> Jeremiah is one of the major prophets. There are four of them Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. Jeremiah. Is some of you were saying you read some of it. It's not real encouraging sometimes what you're reading. And that's true, especially if you dip down in at parts like we're doing tonight. Um, just real quickly, uh, Jeremiah and Lamentations. If you'll notice, it, a little book of Lamentations follows it, I believe, right? Uh, after, yeah, after chapter 52, you've got the little book of Lamentations. Um, we don't know that Jeremiah wrote it. It's actually anonymous, but in the Greek translation of uh, Lamentations, there's a superscription. It says um, that these, these are the words of Jeremiah in the Greek translation. So it's often been attributed to Jeremiah, and um, technically it's anonymous. But Lamentations uh, was written probably late in Jeremiah's life. Uh, after the fall of Jerusalem and after he's probably gone into Egypt into exile. And it's a lament, it's a dirge, it's a, like, almost like a funeral dirge over Jerusalem being destroyed by the Babylonians. So that's the little book that follows it, and that's why it's right after, right after Jeremiah. So at what time is Jeremiah living and what's going on in the world? So let's just do a little bit of background before we get into this. Um, if we go back to Isaiah, the book before this, Isaiah writes really in two major contexts. One is when the Assyrians, and I'm talking about Isaiah first, okay? This is Isaiah before Jeremiah. So Assyrian um, threat came to the northern tribes of Israel. Okay. What are those northern tribes? Probably easier to say which ones they weren't. There were 10 of them, 10 northern tribes. Remember, Jacob had 12 sons. There were 12 tribes. Mm -hmm. But the Assyrian threat comes to those northern tribes, and they finally are sacked, if you will, in 722 B.C. And Isaiah 1 through 39, which is really the major first half, is about that Assyrian threat. The second part of Isaiah, the, 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 the more glowing part of Isaiah, the more uplifting part, if you will, 40 through 66, is really more, of, if you will, a forward looking for the Babylonian exile and what's going to happen then. Uh, and that comes later, and finally in 586 B.C., the Babylonians take the other two tribes, so there's 10, and then there's two southern tribes that get taken later. So 586, 72, that's what, about 140 years. I know you got to count backwards there, sorry, but um, about 140 year difference between that. Jeremiah is primarily about the Babylonian exile. <laughs> Jeremiah is called to be the prophet to tell Israel, shape up, or you don't have to stop <laughs> <laughs> or that old phrase, shape up or ship, ship, out. Out. ship out. And they really are shipped out. They are carted out, really. And and so Jer <coughs> Jeremiah does not have a like uh, he doesn't have a glamorous job. He doesn't have a glamorous ministry for sure. Um, and so Looking at what's going on here, Jeremiah's in Judah, and he has a message for the people. He's born about 650, if you will, B.C. Long, long time ago, Jeremiah was born. 
It's all a long time ago. And he's called to be a prophet. Uh, we can work it out with the first couple of verses of Jeremiah 1. So if you're looking at Jeremiah chapter 1, it says, The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, one of the priests, who was when Anathoth in the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah. Um, later on, well, it goes on and it says, Kings of Judah in the 13th year of his reign. So we can do some dating there. And if you do the dating, he becomes a prophet around 626. BC. So how old is he? He's a young, young pup, 23, 24 years old. Right. <clears throat> and so we know kind of when he starts become uh, called to be a prophet here. Josiah, if you remember anything about your Old Testament, Josiah was the king who became king almost like eight or nine years old. He was a young pup. And so he had some good advisors. Uh, he turned out to be a very godly king, one of the few godly kings in the Bible, in the Old Testament. And he puts his trust in the Lord. And at the start of his ministry, Jeremiah really sort of encourages him to get right behind everything that, that God is telling him to do. So he starts out with Josiah, this young king, and he really kind of helps Josiah to get on the right track with his with his his uh, reign. But after this, there are many kings that follow Josiah. Okay? And Jeremiah has to suffer through these other kings' reigns. Okay? And I mean he suffers through them. Um, because these are not so godly kings that follow Josiah. And it will be at that point that Jeremiah's ministry becomes one of much more confrontation with the king. And by the way, I mean, the prophet's primary role in the Old Testament was to keep the king in line with what God had told the king to do in, in, in terms of ruling the people. So with Josiah, a lot easier, but boy, did it go downhill from there with the kings that followed him for, for Jeremiah. So how did he become a prophet? Mm. Well, like Isaiah, he was called. He was called by the Lord himself. But there was a very different call than the, all the other prophets that Jeremiah has. We're told here, we're just going to go through these first few verses of the chapter here, but picking it up with verse 4. Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, uh, and here we got the word of the Lord coming to him. He was not sort of a prophet from birth. And how do we know he was not a prophet from birth? You go back to the first verse. Look at his heritage. Look at verse 1. What, is it, what do you know based on verse 1 about this guy? His family were <coughs> the priests. Priest, exactly. So in, you know, in, in Hebrew culture, I mean, just, you know, his father was a priest. And guess what the son does? I mean, they're, they're, this is the tribe of Aaron. So you just follow in line with, you, remember there's one tribe that's the priestly tribe. <laughs> And so he has to follow in line with what his father has been teaching him. But God says here at 24 years of age, you're not going to be a priest. You're going to be a prophet. And so um, he gets a different call in his life. Um, Great pro-life verse there. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. So let's move on down to verse 5 here. Before, he's called, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart and appointed you to be a prophet to the nations. Amazing. Amazing. Think about that. Because God had a sense of what he wanted Jeremiah to, to be, even before Jeremiah was a twinkle in his parents' eyes. Way before. God had a plan and a purpose for him to be a prophet. And Jeremiah responds, I don't know how to speak. <laughs> Which, by the way, is pretty important for a prophet, <laughs> right? You've got to be able to speak if you're going to be a prophet. And uh, so pretty basic thing for a prophet. Uh, he says, I don't know how to speak. I'm only a child. And God says to him, don't say to me I'm a child. You must go to everyone I send you and say whatever I tell you. <laughs> don't be afraid of them. It's always troubling when God says, don't be afraid. 
There's normally a reason why the fear comes up, right? Or clearly he's swelling up his thinking. No, my goodness, I can't do this, Jeremiah thinks. I can't do this. Are you kidding me? God says, don't be afraid. See right into his heart. He knew, God knows us so well. He knows how we're going to respond. And he says, I'm with you. I'll rescue you. And then the Lord reached out his hand and touched his mouth. Yeah. Yeah. Does that remind you of another prophet? It's better than a burning coal. <laughs> right. Right. So it reminds you of Isaiah, in chapter 6 of Isaiah, where he's touched with that burning coal. Right. God touches his lips and says, I've put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow. Oh, wow. There's going to be a lot of challenging work here for Jeremiah. Uproot and tear down, destroy and overthrow. Why? Because there was so much in Judah at that time that did need pulling down and destroying the godless ways of the people. But also he says to, and this is encouraging part, to build and to plant. Build and to plant. Because there's going to be hope in your ministry. There's going to be hope. It's, it's a double-edged double, double edged sword, if you will. How did he process this personally? How did Jeremiah process this personally? Was he just a channel for a message from God? With all of the prophets, we, we never think of them as just a sort of loudspeaker with God on the microphone at the other end. And God pressing a button and then they open their mouth and then these words come in. These prophets throughout the Old Testament, God uses them. He uses their character. He uses their background. He uses their training. So, for example, Ezekiel. Ezekiel also is from a priestly family, a priestly line. And God uses his priestly line through his prophetic message. If you read Ezekiel, it's very priestly. It's all this priestly language. So God used his priestly training to help him get a message out that the people needed to hear. There's a lot in Ezekiel about the temple. Chapters 40 through 48 is all about the temple. Well, how did he know about the temple? Because he had been trained as a priest, right? Isaiah, well-trained, well-educated, that's because Isaiah writes the most beautiful poetry probably in the whole Bible. Isaiah was well-trained. His, his language is, oh my gosh, nobody can compare with Isaiah. It's, it's just amazing. Comfort, comfort my people. Mm -hmm. You know, out of the wilderness have I called. I mean, just, just go, I mean, I don't know. It's amazing how Isaiah wrote. But he's well-trained, and God gives him this beautiful poetry. All of Isaiah, almost all of his poetry. Poetry. You know how hard it is to write poetry? I, I don't even want it. You know. And Hebrew poetry, I mean, it's you know, all in parallel, like parallel lines. Just the imagery he uses, I mean, amazing. Amazing how God used his training to do that. And he seems to have easy access to royal courts. Isaiah moved in and out of the royal courts with no problem. God used that background in Isaiah's life to help him to speak to these kings and to, to make a difference. Jeremiah, very different. And that's the way it is with all of us, okay? None of us is the same. Jeremiah, very different. And there seemed to be a lot of internal struggle in Jeremiah. I mean, a lot of internal struggle. So we can take, those of us who struggle with how God works in life, we can take hope with Jeremiah, okay? So I think for Jeremiah, it wasn't just a case of opening his mouth and giving it. That's not the way it worked. This often cost him a lot. There would be a lot of inner processing that he would have to go through to speak the word of the Lord. Okay? And just because somebody's called to be a prophet does not mean they open their mouths and out it comes. It's almost, trust me, and Christine can relate to this, preparing a sermon is, if you really are into it, it's hard work. It's if, if you really, if you want to hear from the Lord, it, it's, it could be agonizing um, if you're really trying to hear what God is trying to say. So 
Jeremiah has a lot of inner processing. Um, it's almost as if God puts the thought increasingly in their heart and mind and impresses it upon them until they can't help the then speak in that particular context. That's more how it works with preaching. If you're truly called by God, if you're really listening to God, that's the way typically sermons work. <laughs> now, I'm not, not everybody's the same, but I, you know, I've taught seminarians, I, you know, I've, I've done this myself. That's, that's the way I see it working more often than not. God puts a thought increasingly in, the, in a preacher's heart, a prophet's heart, and impress it upon them until they can't help but then speak it out. Right? That's when you soak yourself in Scripture. You know, that's what happens. You just can't help but say, this, this is what you got to say, Lord, through me uh, in this particular word. Because you can say a lot of things. But the particular word that you have to say for that particular time is impressed upon you for that moment. There's clearly a lot of turmoil and at times anguish goes on within Jeremiah to bring these words out. Robin, we get home on Sunday afternoons, and Robin goes, you've got to be tired. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, well, I am tired, but I'm energized too. You know, it's, 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 only, it's, it's a weird feeling, really. Jeremiah really took this personally, this word that God gave to him, that Israel, his people, were not walking with God. He took it personally. And that's why you see this anguish in it at Jeremiah. I don't think we should see Jeremiah or any of these prophets as clinically cold, declaring judgment that he's coming. I don't know that he had the picket sign out there. You know, I'm not, I just don't see him quite like that. There's a lot of anguish that's going on. He's often called the weeping prophet. And this comes deep from him. So he cared about his people, and actually it was because he cared that he took it so personally that it cost him this pain and that he had these inner turmoils. And that lament, lamentation, the one that comes after this, oh my gosh, he puts it in first person. He's talking about Jerusalem, but he makes it personal about himself. That first chapter in Lamentations is about a woman who's lost her child. It's just, it's just very riveting the way he, he puts it. So my, I guess what I'm trying to say is so... I think I would encourage us not to think of Jeremiah or other prophets as these cold, harsh, uncaring speakers. <laughs> these people care deeply about their people. And uh, when we hear God's anger and God's really judgment coming through, remember that as you think about that. Um, that there was a lot of turmoil in this. Any parent who loves their child knows this. When you have to be harsh with your kids, there's just so much inner turmoil that's going on. Well, at the end of chapter 1, the call to Jeremiah, God says to him, you are going to have to get ready and stand up and say whatever I command you. Okay? Again, don't be afraid of them. Don't be afraid of them. But today, I've made you a fortified city, an iron pillar, a bronze wall. That's the image. He's this is you, Jeremiah. You are these things. You are a fortified city. You are an iron pillar. You are a bronze wall. That's what I'm making you, to stand against the whole land. Because he's going to need to be <laughs> when he starts talking to his kindred people. He's going to have to be like that. As Bill Maddox would say, he's going to have to have tough skin, <laughs> thick skin, right? <laughs> he's going to have to have very thick skin to do this. Or it's not going to work. I like the way he says in, in verse 12, he said, uh, you know, he tells, ask Jeremiah, what do you see? I see a branch of an olive tree. And the Lord says, you have seen correctly, for I am watching. <laughs> see that my word is fulfilled. It's not like, you know, you get on an assignment from your superior, then you go back in the office, shut the door, and get right. to work on the assignment. It's, right. It's, yeah. it's, He's superintending this whole project, isn't he, very closely? Yes, yes, that's right. That's good. Um, okay, so let me just give you a few examples of the pain that I, uh, you know this stuff, but let me just run through a couple of passages here with you. This is how agonizing this was for Jeremiah. Um, he had to go through a lot of suffering here. 
and all kinds of suffering. But God helped him through each of his suffering. And God, God will help us through any suffering that we face. And Jeremiah is a good example of this, okay? So, what was some of the stuff that he actually experienced as he seeks to, to fulfill this call from God? So look at chapter 11, verse 21. Look at some of the sufferings he had to go through. <clears throat> and this is true also in chapter 18, verse 18. People are plotting to destroy him and kill him. Okay? We think we got it bad. Okay. 11, 21. 11, 21. What does it say? Somebody read that. Therefore, this is what the Lord says about the men of Anathoth, who are seeking your life and saying, Do not prophesy in the name of the Lord, or you will die by our hands. Okay, don't say that word. You, we will kill you. We will kill you. And then same kind of thing. Look at chapter 18. Flip over 18, 18. Same thing going on. Is it right there? Yeah, 18, 18. Someone read that one for us. Then they said, Come, let us make plots against Jeremiah, for the law shall not perish from the priest, nor counsel from the wise, nor the word from the prophet. Come, let us strike him with a tongue, and let us not pay attention to any of his words. Yeah. <laughs> These are his close close folks. <coughs> yeah. uh, so, so, so that's, okay. And look, look at chapter 20, verse 2. He, he's confronted by a name called... Pashur, or, or, yeah, Pashur, yeah. He's a priest, okay? How do you like that? Mm. How about reading that, chapter 20, verse 2, there's someone. Then Pashur beat Jeremiah the prophet and put him in the stocks that were in the upper Benjamin gate of the house of the Lord. Yeah, so this fellow worker in the, in the vineyard just beats him. So anyway, it's crazy. Uh, put in stocks. And he faces constant derision from people, even from people who, who've been his trusted friends. Talk about strong faith. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. He's, this man is betrayed. <laughs> betrayed by his closest people. 26, 8. Look at chapter 26, verse 8. <clears throat> Anybody get that? If you'll read it for us. And when Jeremiah had finished speaking, all that the Lord had commanded him to speak to all the people, and the priests and the prophets and all the people laid hold on of him, saying, You shall die. Why have you prophesied in the name of the Lord, saying, This house shall be like Shiloh, and this city shall be desolate without inhabitant? And all the people gathered around Jeremiah in the house of the Lord. So again, priest, um, um, <coughs> fellow prophets, they disagree with his message, and they just say, hey, we'll take you out. We will take you out. Now granted, his message is not... a good job. <laughs> what the heck? Tough job. I don't want to apply for it. Nobody in their right mind applies. Nobody, <laughs> that's right. Nobody applies for this job. No, he, he didn't apply for this job. Wow. Um, 20, uh, look at 36, 23. I think it's one of our, a couple more here. Chapter 36, verse 23. You get it? Read it for 36, us. what? Uh, 23. 36, 23. As Dehudi read three or four columns, the king would cut them off with a knife and throw them into the fire, in the fire pot, until the entire scroll was consumed <laughs> Am I in the right? Yeah. You're exactly right. It's just unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. I've read it all. Wait, yeah. I, wait, finish it. Out and yeah, <laughs> until the entire scroll was consumed in the fire that was in the fire pot. Keep going. No, no, that's it. He's reading in front of the king. Yeah, Jehoiakim. Jehoiakim is taking his scroll and ripping it up. The, the Bible. Well, the king is and, and throwing it into the, the fire. That's the Torah, right? That's the Torah. Oh. See, oh. this is what Jeremiah faced. Oh. It happens today. It happens today. Yeah. Very much so. Yeah, there are groups that take out pages of the Bible if they don't like it. 
They don't use those. <laughs> yeah. Well, they're pastor being in prison for being a pastor. Telling the truth. Yep. So yeah, this is it, it, it's right. No, nothing new in the song. Um, Thirty-seven fifteen. Thirty-seven fifteen. You get it? Read it for us. But I, I write you, I write you, wouldn't listen to him. He arrested him and took him to the police. The police were furious with Jeremiah. They beat him up and threw him into jail in the house of Jonathan, the Secretary of State. They were using the house for a prison cell. <laughs> yeah. So Jeremiah entered an underground cell in a cistern turned into a dungeon. He stayed there a long time. Yeah. Oh, so he's nice. gone mm -hmm. into prison. <coughs> yeah. 38.6. Last, well, two more. 38.6. 38.6. So they took Jeremiah and cast him into the cistern of Malchia, the king's son, which was in the court of the guard, letting Jeremiah down by ropes. And there was no water in the cistern, but only mud. And Jeremiah sank in the mud. Ew. Lowered into an empty, muddy cistern, left there until he's eventually brought out of that. And then he's kept in the courtyard under arrest after getting out of there until Jerusalem is captured. Last one, chapter 43, verses 6 and 7. You get it? Read it for us. 43, verses 6 and 7. The men, the women, the children, the princesses, and every person whom Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, had left with, Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, and also Jeremiah the prophet, and Baruch, the son of Neriah. And they came into the land of Egypt, for they did not obey the voice of the Lord, and they arrived at Tophanes. So he's actually at the end of his life. He told the people, I want to stay here and talk to the Babylonians. He said, no, we're taking you to Egypt against his will. So he was carted out of the country to live forever and ever in Egypt. So, as how, how old was he when he died? I mean, how long did all this go? We don't on? know. We don't know because we don't know when he died and how he died in, in Egypt. So we just know he went into Egypt and we have no clue. The only thing we probably can surmise is he probably wrote Lamentations while he was there, but I don't don't know when. You know, unfortunately. As you as some of you said, this is not a career choice. Okay. <laughs> We would not have chosen this. And Jeremiah went through tough stuff. So little wonder he feels so deeply about everything. Okay? All right, but again, this cost him. And very often doing what God has called us to do will still cost us today, as we've been talking about. It's not just a case of God called me to do this. Now everything will be straightforward. That's just not the way it works. God calls us to be to live in these hard places, to take up our crosses, and to uh, carry them, right? That's what Jesus told us we would be doing. Uh, in Western Christianity, somehow this has gotten lost in the message. And maybe why we're facing many of the things we're facing, I don't know. I'm not, I don't want to go there. But yeah, it probably has something to do with that. Um, but I know when I started following the Lord, um, I got a call to be a Christian educator or Christian minister. I didn't know what it was 40 some years ago. You know, it's not always been smooth sailing. You know, there's been challenges personally, uh, challenges, um, you know, family life, challenges in my ministerial life. Uh, all kinds of things have happened. So, you know, sometimes responding to the call is the easy part. <laughs> Uh, doing it is the challenge, and uh, you know I know ministers who lost their lives for this, and, and so on and so forth. Um, and just you know, we all have a call. You know, it's not just the ordained ministry, lay, lay ministry. All of us have a call to to follow Christ, and we will uh, suffer. We've suffered with our families, perhaps. You know, and just sharing the gospel with our family members. Um, you know, there's no end to this. But I wanted you to know that Jeremiah, even though he's suffering pain, it's not a self-pitying pain, okay? It's not a pity party that Jeremiah's having. Uh, even Lamentations is not a pity party, these five chapters of lament. He's feeling the pain because God's people have drifted so far from God and won't come back to him. 
and he sees what's going to happen to them even if they don't see what's happening. So regarding or responding to the call of God can and will be costly at times that Jeremiah shows us. So that's one of, the, one of the main things about this book is that following the Lord is costly. And I think the Western church especially has to relearn this again. I looked up the meaning of its name and it says that God will rise or uh, God is exalted. Yeah. yeah, so you had to remember, I've been named, God is exalted. So even as he's down and out, my name, God, I will praise you. Even my name is praise to you. He, he got the name for the job, didn't he? He did. <laughs> he did. Absolutely. He did. Amen. Um, so we have about 17, 18 minutes. Um, I think I'll stop there. I wanted, uh, I've got an 18-minute clip of <coughs> Jeremiah chapter 18. Um, and so let's look at a few verses. And then I've got a clip of a... He's actually a Methodist minister that I know from Asbury. He's a potter, and he's from Texas, West Texas, and he does a whole presentation on why pottery uh, and what the spiritual formation that comes out of knowing pottery. So let's take a look at that. But let's just read 18, a few of these verses here. Chapter 18, verse 1. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, Arise and go down to the potter's house. And there I will let you hear my words. So I went down to the potter's house, and there he was working at his wheel. And the vessel... Ah, thank you. My eyes are killing me here, or failing me. And the vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hand, and he reworked it into another vessel as it seemed good to the potter to do. Then the word of the Lord came to me, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter has done, declares the Lord. Behold, like the city, or excuse me, I can't see up here. <laughs> like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. If at any time I declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will pluck up and break down and destroy it, and if that nation concerning which I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I intended to do to it. And if at any time I declare concerning the nation or a kingdom that I will build and plant it, and if it does evil in my sight, not listening to my voice, then I will relent of the good that I intended to do to it. Now therefore say to the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I am shaping disaster against you, and devising a plan against you. Return everyone from his evil way and amend your ways and your deeds. But they said, that is in vain. We will follow our own plans and will everyone act according to the stubbornness of his evil heart. All right. All right, so what's the point of the potter and the clay? So let's just listen to Buff Hearn is his name. And uh, let me get this working here. 